let me begin this sixth and last talk in this series of six talks on the church with a reading from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 18, verse 1 and following. Just then the disciples came up to Jesus with the question, who is of greatest importance in the kingdom of God? He called a little child over and stood him in their midst and said, I assure you, unless you change and become like little children, you will not enter the kingdom of God. Whoever makes himself lowly becoming like this child is of greatest importance in that heavenly reign. Whoever welcomes one such child for my sake welcomes me. On the other hand, it would be better for anyone who leads astray one of these little ones who believe in me to be drowned by a millstone around the neck in the depths of the sea. What terrible things will come on the world through scandal? It is inevitable that scandal should occur. Nevertheless, woe to that man through whom scandal comes. A woman at a workplace was once at lunch talking. My mother was there. My mother was a registered nurse over 40 years. And the woman was ranting and raving about priests. Oh, they're no good. They're all pedophiles and homosexuals. They tell us to do one thing and they do another. And it went on and on and it went from bad to worse. And my mother said, whatever her name was, bite your tongue. They're not all that, that way. Very few. And you shouldn't talk that way because they belong to God. A short time later, the woman came down with cancer of the mouth. It ate her whole face away and killed her. I always thought, that was interesting. Coincidence, perhaps. Nonetheless, rather interesting. We have a painful, sad mess on our hands. Scandal. The beautiful body and bride of Christ defiled. I have been talking all day and last evening about the church. I've been trying to say a few things in the limited time I have to uh, be helpful possibly to some of you, perhaps uh, tell you what you already know. Sometimes that's good. It helps to confirm us. I know I don't, I don't say much, if anything, that would be new to you. I probably couldn't do that. I shouldn't do that. It's all old stuff. It's just the normal teaching of the church. But hopefully, some of these topics have been helpful. I have never tried to shirk my responsibility as a priest and as a preacher of the truth. I have tried honestly. In the time I've been preaching, which isn't long, but which has reached millions of people, I've tried to tell the truth. At times, I might not have been so great at it. Me, I have deficiencies like everything else. But honestly, if I died right now and stood before God, I may have to answer for a lot of things in my life. But I can tell you probably I wouldn't much have to answer for not telling the truth to the people in season 
out of season, convenient, inconvenient. As uh, one good elderly Catholic lady said to me, she said, Father, you're, you're the dirty Harry of preaching. <laughs> you remember dirty Harry? <laughs> He was, he was kind of a, he, he got the job done, you know, but, um, you know, remember his famous line, make my day. <laughs> I've been threatened in various ways, and I just have to say, you know, honestly, make my day. You know, if I can't preach, I'll go fishing more. Hmm? I, I, I'll spend more time with my dogs. And most of all, I can pray more. I can always do that, and that's what counts anyway. But so long as I can, I'll preach, trusting that our mother and her son will protect me as long as I need to be protected, and then when my hour comes, my hour comes. I'll be going down to see... Mother Angelica, soon, I'll give her your love. I'll give her your regards. <laughs> but we come to those junctures in our life, whether you're a parent, whether you're a pastor, whether you're a preacher, every now and then you come to those tough junctures in the road. And you've got to make a decision. And you've got to follow your conscience. And you've got to tell it like it is. Because a failure to do so becomes negligence at best, cowardice at worst. And so I've got to address it. I've got to talk about scandal. I've got to talk about the attack on the church from within and from without. Got to do it. You don't have to believe me. Because a lot of what I'm going to say now, unlike what I usually do, which is doctrinal, I normally just give you the doctrine, the faith, and the morals of the church. A lot of this is just my opinion. You don't have to accept that. That's for sure. But it's based on my observations. Like I said, I've preached in most of the states, all the provinces of Canada, except Newfoundland, and I'll be going there sooner or later. They've invited me many times. I've seen a lot. I've seen a broad cross-section of the church. I have experienced things firsthand, not as a second-hand observer, but as a first-hand observer. And so, although it is just my personal opinion, it might count for a little bit. You've got to face things head on. It is not in our best interest to run from the truth. It is never in your best interest to bury your head like an ostrich and hope it'll just go away. It won't. You can deal with it sooner or later. Like the commercial said, you can pay me now or later. In every sphere of influence I know of. And I've had contact with athletics. I've, I've played sports when I was young. I was in the military. I, I know what it's like in the military. I know what it's like in the corporate world. And in every sphere of influence that I know of, there are certain basic rules that operate. You ignore the rules, and you are at your own peril. In many respects, in recent years, if the church were a football team, it would lose every game. A military unit, it would be overrun and wiped out. A corporation, it would be bankrupt. But it's not any of those things. The human side of it is weak, sinful. But there is another side, the divine side. The church is of divine institution, and it will go on 
until Christ comes again in glory. Uh, I recall a story from the Second Vatican Council. There were some Protestant Pariti um, experts who were observers at the council, and they were having dinner with a certain cardinal. And uh, they, they, were, they were good men, but they were trying to, I, I don't know if they were trying to aggravate the, uh, the cardinal or get a jibe in here and there, and they at one point said, look, the Catholic Church is failing. Uh, you're diminishing, you know. Um, pretty soon you're apt to be out of existence. And the cardinal laughed out loud. And he said, maybe you're inferring you're going to help us along. You know, maybe you'll help precipitate our demise. And he said, look, we've been trying to destroy it for 2,000 years, and we haven't succeeded. <laughs> it's going to be still standing when the Lord comes back. It's going to go on. But that being said, what do we do? How do we handle this? Basic principle. When you're wrong, admit it. If you're guilty, take your medicine. Be a man or a woman. Stand up, tell the truth, and it takes humility to do that. You know, humility is an awfully great thing. Humility can overcome any obstacle. I remember a story from the annals of the fathers of the desert. St. Anthony of the desert, the great father of monks, great anchorite, hermit. He was praying in the desert one day, and the devil came along. And St. Anthony said, Ah, Satan, wherefore goest thou? that I have just come from tempting the brethren. And he went on, ah, Anthony, yes. They say you are a great saint. You fast continually. I never eat. Ah, Anthony, you keep vigil. You deprive yourself of sleep night after night. I never sleep. But Anthony, you have defeated me, for you are humble, and I have no defense against humility. Anyone can make a mistake. Anyone can fall into the worst possible sin. I learned a long time ago that except for the grace of God, I could be the worst of the worst. I know that. I have no doubt in my mind that I could be the worst mass murderer, or you name it, whatever you can think of. I honestly believe that under a certain set of circumstances, a certain set of environmental conditions, any one of us could be the worst of the worst. I believe it. I've seen that. I've seen a lot of things. I've experienced a lot of things. So when someone falls into serious sin, whoever it is, whatever the sin might be, I am not that shocked. Uh, I, I am not that taken back. And I always say, always, except for the grace of God, there go I. St. Philip Neri said that. Passing through the streets of Rome one day, he saw a man being led to the gallows, a terrible murderer. And St. Philip Neri pointed to him and said exactly that. Except for the grace of God, there go I. Humility is basically the acknowledgement of the truth. St. Teresa of Jesus, great doctor of the church, said that. St. Therese used to say that. Mother Teresa of Calcutta used to say that. Humility is the acknowledgement of the truth. The truth of who God is. The all-powerful. The eternal one. The all-seeing. 
That's God. God's everything. Me? I'm nothing. I'm a speck of dust in the cosmos. God loves the speck, however. And because of that, there is a certain great greatness involved. So, yes, God is God, and we are creatures. God is all-powerful. He's the creator. We are creatures. We are finite. He is infinite. That's the truth. If you live in that, you're humble. That truth will indeed set you free. A humble man dwells in the truth. A humble man dwells in unapproachable light. A humble man lives in an impregnable fortress. Humility is a defending wall against which the enemy can do nothing. We find ourselves in an untenable, embarrassing, humiliating situation. Some of our brothers have fallen big time. Some of our priests have abused their authority in sexually abusing underage persons, whether male or female, And it is a great scandal. It is a tragedy. It is worse when one of us do it. There is no question about that. You may say, yes, but all kinds of people do that. And you're right. All kinds of people do that. But when one of us does it, it's much worse. Do you have a right to expect more from a priest? Yes. But you also have to be grown-up people, too, and realize that priests are men. And men and women commit sins. We're vulnerable. We're frail. We're fragile. We labor under the weight of the consequences of original sin. There's a word in Latin that is used, the fome. And, and it means, oh, it's like a tinder. You ever build a fire in a fireplace or a wood stove or uh, out in a campfire? You, you take paper, and then you take maybe wood shavings, small twigs, and you start the fire, and those catch easily, like shavings of some um, dry wood. They flame right up, don't they? That's the fomes. That's the passion. That's the effects of original sin. It's not that difficult to fall into serious sin. Original sin and its effects, even though baptism removes original sin, the effects of it remain, and they can flare up at any time. When a man is ordained a priest, he is given certain graces, special graces, but he is not removed from his humanity. He remains human and vulnerable. And I will tell you a fact of life you will never hear on CNN or any other media provider. There's a war at hand, and our battle is not against flesh and blood. We have spiritual enemies. That's a fact. I don't have time for the people who don't believe what we believe. I'm talking to you. I'm not talking to them. I respect them. They can believe anything they want. But we believe in the existence of this spiritual combat. We believe in the existence of spiritual enemies. Now, I want you to think for a moment. If you are an officer in the army and the enemy force is out there, one of your tactics and strategies is going to be to take out the officers of the enemy force. That's a common tactic. We have snipers to do that. So does the enemy. Now, the leaders in the church are the priests and bishops. Logic tells you that the enemy is going to take his best shots at them. Why? Common sense. The devil's a tactician, a strategist. He will take out the leadership. Why? Strike the shepherds, scatter the sheep. Common sense 
logic. Why wouldn't he do that? Of course, that's what's going on. Are some of the priests accused of these terrible things? Are some of them guilty? You bet. Can't get away from that. I hate to acknowledge it and think about it, but it's true. What do you do with the truth? You face it head on. Repent. It takes a lot of courage and most of all humility to acknowledge our sins. I am my brother's keeper. I am my brother's keeper. And although it aggravates the living heck out of me that some of us did such stupid, base, cruel, unthinkable, horrendous things, I hate it. I hate the sin. But I don't hate my brother. I love my brother. I love the sinner, hate the sin. That's an old saying. You would do well to remember it. Love the sinner. Hate the sin. I must offer reparation for my brother. I am my brother's keeper. And part of the blame is mine. Why? Because I have failed to be as holy as I should be. There is a oneness in all the universe. There is a oneness in the one church. Wherever one of us is, there the entire body is made present through the inviolable mystery of unity. Perhaps I didn't pray enough. Perhaps I wasn't assiduous enough in doing penance. Perhaps I should have been depriving myself of certain licit pleasures to bring down graces on my brother. Perhaps my brother's frailty, my brother's sin, my brother's Failure, my brother's scandal, is my fault. I can't be too quick to point a finger. They brought a woman to Jesus. She'd been caught red-handed committing adultery. Maybe some of you have committed adultery. Maybe some of you have been victimized by a spouse who committed adultery. Terrible pain involved in that. This woman had committed adultery. Now, the Mosaic law prescribed death by stoning for anyone caught or convicted of committing adultery. That's serious business, capital crime. Commit adultery, die. That's the Mosaic law. That's the Old Testament. They brought this woman to Jesus. We caught her red-handed committing adultery. What do you have to say about it? They were testing him. Jesus bent down, and he began to trace in the dirt. straightened up and he said let the man among you who is without sin cast the first stone he bent down again and traced in the dirt and they began to leave the oldest first scripture tells us you ever wonder what Jesus was writing in the dirt? Like maybe their sins? And they left, one by one, the oldest first. I wonder why the oldest first. Maybe because they're wiser. Maybe because they get it the quickest. Maybe because they've lived the longest and had the most sins. I don't know. 
some of the fathers made commentary to that effect. Jesus turned to the woman. Is there no one to condemn you? No, Lord. Then neither do I condemn you. Therefore, go. But commit this sin no more. Other than the victims and their families, nobody has a right to be more angry about this mess than we priests who are left. For we have given up everything to serve you. We could have been doctors and lawyers. We could have made a lot of money. We could have had worldly acclaim. We could have had a much higher level of worldly success. But no, we went off to the seminary and we studied for 8, 10, 12 years. I spent almost 12 years in university classrooms preparing. And now, the world's perception of us is greatly diminished. I travel everywhere constantly. In the immediate aftermath of September 11th, our stock was never higher. Preceding that, there was general indifference when a priest passed through society. I fly over 100,000 miles a year every year. Indifference. September 11th came and went. The immediate aftermath of it, a couple days later, I got on a plane. The pilot came right out of the cockpit. As I got in the plane, he ran up to me and hugged me. Boy, I'm glad to see you, Father. And I said, I bet you are. <laughs> Flight attendants came out and gathered around like I was a movie star. <laughs> our stock was never higher. You know, one of our members had been killed at the World Trade Center, ministering to the firemen, giving them the anointing of the sick. And, and people were jarred into reality. Nothing like close proximity to death to get you in touch with reality. No atheist in foxholes, I assure you. The lines for confession were long. Mass attendance was packed. Then time. A week, two weeks, then the scandals broke. And I can tell you that our stock's never been lower. I, I wonder now it's gone from indifference to great acceptance to rejection. Now, you wonder if somebody's going to try to do violence to you, passing through a public place. I was waiting for my flight. There was a little child playing on the floor. His mom was there. The child smiled at me. I smiled back at the child. The mother reacted so violently, snatching the child up, giving me a look that could kill, and stormed off as if to say, you're one of those, and I don't want you anywhere near my child. Unfair? Yes. There are many priests in that category. Oh, no. Listen, I know way more priests than you do. I've met hundreds. I've met thousands of priests all over the world. I've been a lot more priests than almost all of you. And I can tell you that priests are, by and large, the greatest of human beings. They're hardworking. <laughs> They're very hardworking. They sacrifice a great deal. 
They're faithful to their vows. They're obedient. They're humble. They're chaste. Okay, they're human. Maybe they commit a sin here and there, now and then. One thing to commit a sin, it's another thing to live in sin. The vast majority of priests, and I know a lot of them, they're fine, decent human beings, and they're doing a great deal to help get you to heaven. And I know you appreciate us. There are a few who are extremely wounded. The devil has taken aim and, and struck them. Serious blows. Why? He's a strategist. Now, does that excuse it? No. How do I feel about it? Am I soft on crime, so to speak? No. No matter of fact, I'm pretty tough. Pretty tough on it. I hate sin. I hate the thought that someone abuses their authority and sexually or any other way abuses another human being. I don't like that. That aggravates me. That angers me. And I have a right to be angry more than anybody else because that has affected me personally, directly. But what do I do about it? Harbor a grudge, become cynical, hateful, leave the church, perhaps, leave the priesthood, perhaps. Not in this lifetime. Not in this lifetime. What I have to do is humble myself. I have to say, except for the grace of God, there go I. I have to say, you know what? I have to say what I said many times preaching to inmates in prisons and jails. You know what, men? The only difference between you and me is that you got caught. And I have to have that attitude. The only difference, I never did those particular things, no. I don't mean that, but I did other things that I never had to answer for. I'll answer to God, all right. Oh, I, sure, when I was young, I committed all the sins of you. And I went to confession, and I was sincerely repenting. But I know that except for the grace of God, I could be the lowest of the low, the dregs of moral society. I acknowledge that. I believe that. So who am I to judge my brother? But does that mean I think my brother should get off scot-free? No. Do I think my brother should be left in a parish when they know that he has a moral and perhaps psychiatric problem, oh no, get him out. Right away, should he ever be allowed to go back? No. They asked me one day, what should we do with men who have a history of pedophilia? I said, give them a chance to repent and go to a monastery where they can pray and do penance, but not minister in a situation where they have that temptation. That is imprudent to do. I truly believe that. Now, a lot of the bishops are under attack. Cardinal Law has been criticized in Boston, up one side and down the other. I don't know the details of any of these cases, but I do know it's awful easy to pass judgment on other people. I know it's awful easy to say, oh, he should have done this and he should have done that. You know, the Holy Father called the cardinals from America into the Vatican and he talked to them and they said, well, too little, too late. Maybe. Maybe. Maybe it is too little. Maybe it is too late. The cardinal offered to resign humble thing to do. Pope said, no, I won't accept your resignation. And that's the end of that. It's awfully easy to pass judgment, but it's not very smart, spiritually speaking, to do that. Everybody's an expert today. You know, we're all experts in psychiatry. We're all experts in law. 
We're all experts in theology. But we're not, really. And we've got to be very careful with it. What do we do? Where's the blame? Is there any blame? A ton of it, in my estimation. I feel sorry for everybody concerned. I feel sorry for the people of God. Guess who's paying the bill? You. And it will come to hundreds of millions of dollars before it's over. The money that you gave for good cause, the money you put in the collection basket, some of that, now all insurance will pay for some of it, but you know what's going to happen? In case you don't know, the insurance rates will go up so high that no one will be able to afford them. No diocese will be able to have that kind. Believe me, the days of insurance are fading away. Do you know how much it costs for malpractice insurance for a surgeon in the state of Nevada? Over 200000 a year, cash money. Do you know how much this insurance is going to cost? Our diocese now prohibitive. Forget it. And guess what will happen next if there are more awards and judgments? Sell assets. Sell some real estate. The judgment, $50 million. We don't have it. Sell some churches. How did it happen? I feel sorry for the bishops. I do. Mo many of them were not even there when that stuff happened. A lot of these cases are 20, 30 years old. Some of them were there. Some of them are there. Some of them are culpable. But I still feel badly for them. Some of the priests are guilty. This is real. This is not a contrivance of the media, although they're making hay while the sun shines. I read an article where the incidence of sexual abuse in religion is lowest in the Catholic Church, that it's higher in the other religions. You wouldn't know it by the headlines. How did it happen? We were caught sleeping, to be quite honest with you. Like permissive parents, there has been an attitude, and I've got to tell the truth as I see it, there has been an attitude of arrogance in high places, in politics, and in the church. Even where there are good bishops and good dioceses, there can be an arrogance. It is an occupational hazard. I've said that before. I'll say it again. It can sneak up on you. You don't mean to do it. It's not something you will to do consciously. It's something that sneaks up on you. You have authority. Power. Power corrupts. Absolute power corrupts absolutely as the saying goes. Many of us, for many years, warned those in authority. How can this be? Stop it! And we were treated as criminals very often. Like in a case in, with the police. Saw the movie Serpico based on a true story of a New York cop. You know, there was corruption. He didn't like it. He wouldn't go along with it. He blew the whistle. What was he treated like? A criminal. You know? Same thing. I've seen it happen time and time and time again. There has been a prevailing attitude for years of permissiveness, of look the other way of arrogance. How dare you even bring it up? It says in the Bible, judge not lest you be judged. So why are you judging your brother? I've got to make rational judgments, and I've got to make moral judgments. 
I don't want to condemn my brother. I'm not God. But if something is outrageous and in your face, it is sinful not to do something about it. Do you understand you can commit a mortal sin by collaborating with the sin of another, by enabling the sin of another, by ignoring the sin of another, by confirming the sin of another, you commit sin yourself. And many of us sat in guilty silence. And indeed, all that evil requires is that good men and women remain silent. And so the problems compounded themselves. We were beaten into a kind of submission. If you rocked the boat when you were a seminarian, they chastised you bitterly. The next time, you wouldn't be too quick to open your mouth. And you were trained to shut up and go along with the program. And then you got in a parish, and you wanted to preach the truth, and you wanted to tell the people, avoid evil, do good. You wanted to tell them all the things you needed to tell them. But you thought twice about it, because they said, don't rock the boat. Don't push it. And every once in a while, they made an example out of someone. And I know some of the examples. 30 years ordained, 40 years ordained. Father, we don't have an assignment for you. You talk too much. You aggravate people. We've had complaints about you. No salary. No benefits, no retirement, no health insurance. Why don't you go get married, they told one priest of 33 years, who had been unjustly accused by a psychotic woman who had a history of exactly that. And they knew it, but you see, Father was a very faithful solid moral preacher, and he called them. They said, we have no assignment for you. You're finished. Why don't you go get married? That's what they said. Father drives a taxi cab at the age of 70. We could have cleaned up the house ourselves. Do you remember a certain example of a certain little nun with a big mouth who got in an argument with a certain person who had authority in the church? And at a certain meeting of bishops and cardinals, one of them said, we got to get rid of the little nun with a big mouth. We can't have little nuns with big mouths criticizing bishops and cardinals. And another bishop spoke up and said, oh, yes, I agree. However, I have here a list of 157 bishops and cardinals who openly defy the teaching of the Holy Father, and I say, let's get rid of them first. <laughs> and the conversation ended very abruptly. Are there things wrong with the church? Yes, but there's nothing wrong with the divine institution of the church. What is wrong is individual human beings who have failed to be faithful to the church and to Christ. What is wrong is a way of acting, a way of governing that is arrogant, condescending, patronizing. Got to go. What is wrong is a church that acts like a triumphant church while it's still on the face of the earth. The triumphant church is in heaven. On this earth, the militant church is to be a humble church and a servant church. 
And if we do not humble ourselves, then God will humiliate us. If we do not clean up our own house, then God, through his secular instruments, will clean up the church. We can do it the easy way, which is humility, or the hard way. My uncle Tony used to say, boy, some people, you got to hit them between the eyes with a two-by-four just to get their attention. We had a two-by-four September 11th. We got another two-by-four in the church now, hitting us right in the face. How will we respond? Arrogant denial? Humble submission. Bow lowly under the hand of God. Be humble, and God will raise you up. For surely God exalts the humble, but he humbles the proud. There is only one possible response to this mess. Humility. Acknowledgement of guilt where guilt is concerned. And then change things. We cannot afford to be permissive any longer. A bishop has to be a man, first and foremost. He has to be a man. And although I hate to criticize a bishop, and they're criticized too much, and I sympathize with them, all of them, they have an awfully hard job. The weight of the world is on their shoulders. And so I, we must pray for them. But they've got to be a man. First and foremost, and sometimes a man has to do hard things. A man who's head of a family sometimes has to do awful difficult things. And maybe a lot of people won't like him for doing those things. You know how it is when you're a parent and you've got to punish your children, when you've got to correct them? You say, no, you're not going to do that. And they defy you? Sometimes you have to exercise your authority in no uncertain terms. And that authority is service in the final analysis. You know, they throw a tantrum. I've seen priests throw tantrums in front of bishops. How should the bishop respond? Same way a parent should respond when the kid throws a tantrum. What would I do about it? Well, I'd let him rant and rave. But it's still the same. You're not going to do it. You're not going to do it. Well, what if I don't? Then you'll be doing something else. Once I was doing a job for a bishop in a certain diocese, and a number of priests marched in, and demand that the bishop fire me. And the bishop said, well, if you can prove that he's teaching something other than the truth, I will have to fire him because I hired him to teach the truth. Can anyone here convict him of not teaching the truth? And they said, no, but we demand that you fire him, and if you don't, we'll go on strike. <laughs> and I told the bishop, you missed your big chance. I said, he said, what do you mean? I said, you should have had... Father, so-and-so, your secretary, draw a line on the floor with chalk and say, okay, boys, who's first? Cross it. Remove his faculties and see who else tries it. Walk softly, carry a big stick. That's what Teddy Roosevelt used to say. And maybe the advice is good. Permissive parents often lose their children. They lose the respect of their children. Permissive bishops re lose the respect of their priests and people. Sometimes they have to stand up and be a man and say it will be this, 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 and this. Now let me tell you how it happens. Father stops praying. Father stops making his holy hour. Father has no devotion to Our Lady. Father badmouths the Pope up one side and down the other. Father listens to every liberal left-wing theologian 
to come down the pike with a goofy idea. And then father begins to drift into moral never-never land. And he sinks lower and lower. And then one day, you read about it in the newspapers. Was it a surprise? Oh, no. In the seminary, overtly homosexual men acting out their lifestyle, their orientation. Other seminarians complain and are chastised for it. How dare you judge? And they go on and get ordained. And I had one tell me that he was part of a group. And they were involved in orgies, drugs, parties, limousines. Twenty years he lived as part of that. And one morning early he woke up and he said, I'm going to die. It came spontaneously, right out of his sleep. I'm going to die. He went to Fatima. He went to confession. He came back, called his superior, said, I'm leaving. I, I have health problems. I've got to transfer. Went someplace else, began to live a saintly life. One of the best priests I know. I'm going to leave you with a story from the annals of St. Francis of Assisi. When he was toward the end of his life and already acclaimed a saint, St. Francis was going through a region. He came to a town. He had the stigmata already. And St. Francis had the stigmata with the spikes to his hands and feet. He couldn't walk. And he, they had to take him on a donkey or a horse. He was in pain. He was blind from an eye disease, his whole body in pain. They came to a town, and there the parish priest was living in sin with a woman. And the people were scandalized. The people were irate. And now St. Francis was here, and they said, we will tell the saint, and he will go, and he will upbraid that sinful priest. And so they went in procession with candles and torches lit, and they came up to the rectory, and they pounded on the door. And the poor, unfortunate sinner of a priest came out. And they led St. Francis, almost blind, unable to walk. And they said, here he is. Here's the priest. St. Francis fell down on his knees. He took the man's hands in his own and he kissed them. And he said, all I know and all I want to know is that these hands bring me Jesus. The man was converted on the spot. He lived a holy, priestly life. And he died a holy death. With that, I leave. God bless you.